Welcome back to the Wrestling Apple Center here on the Blaze 1260 AM. And joining us now, we have none other than Chris Canyon. Chris, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, buddy. That's a pleasure to be on, man. Thanks for having me. So i got to ask you the first question. Who is better than Canyon? Well, everybody knows the answer to that. Nobody, right? It always will be nobody. <laughs> Oh, man, yeah, yeah. I've been a bit of big fan of yours for many, many years. Of course, the first time I had an opportunity to see you was in WCW. We interviewed uh, Father James Mitchell, actually, about two years ago. And uh, he said, he called it Mortal Kombat crap, the thing that you guys are doing. Would you agree with his uh, assumption of what that character was about? Um, mortal, what do you call it, Mortal Kombat crap? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it was a, a good idea at a good time to do it. Um, it just ended up being bad timing because just as we were about to get up and going and rolling with it is when the NWO hit. Yeah. I think if, I think if that didn't happen, I think the uh, company would have put a little bit more uh, attention on us. Uh, Kevin Tolson might have focused on us a little bit more. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe more would have come of it. Mm. But, uh, you know, that was a good idea. Uh, you know, everybody worked hard at it. Putting a, a press tag into it, I don't think was the best idea. Uh, I like Ernest Miller, but, you know, if you're going to create a something that different and have that kind of build up towards it. I don't know if you want to put brand new guys in it. You know, I think a Rob Van Dam might have been a better guy to have in there. Hmm. Was there talk of bringing an RVD in there? Yeah, we actually negotiated with him and he turned us down. He t- Wow. He, he, yeah, he had done a little WCW before that. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. And they called him Rob V. and uh, I think that's when Raven was in his Johnny Flamingo and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think he was somewhat soured on what they did with him. Uh, I don't think he was that happy with the company and uh, it was hard to convince them to come in. Hmm. One of my favorite gimmicks was when you did the whole uh, under the mask thing, and of course you had the feud with Raven. How was Raven to work with? Oh, he was great. Me, me and him had, uh, you know, one thing about Raven, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of things to say about Raven. He does look out for younger guys. He tries to, I mean, I don't know if it's 100% him trying to help all the guys, or he just thinks that, you know, it's going to help his career. But, you know, the whole flock idea got a, a lot of guys' names on the mask, you know. Uh, and guys that could have been even bigger, like the Chick Boy, could have been a lot bigger, I think, if uh, done the right thing with him. But that got Kidman noticed for, uh, you know, Lodi. I mean, Raven, if it wasn't for Raven, those guys might not have had the career they had. So, uh, you know, Ray- Raven was fun, man. He-, he has great ideas. He has a lot of ideas. Uh, he's pretty flexible when it comes to, uh, you know, if you want to change things and open some new ideas. Yeah, Raven's, Raven's, a lot of us go as far as saying he's a genius. I know he calls himself a genius, but, uh, He's a smart guy when it comes to the business. He's been doing it a long time, and he knows what it takes to get over. And uh, you know, he's had a great run so far. And it was, it was a pleasure to work with him. And I hope you know someday in the future, maybe I'll get to work with him again. Well, he's the current NWA champion. And uh, for those who don't know, you said that you're on your way to uh, the TNA tapings right now, aren't you? Yeah, actually, you might hear the wind in the background, and I'm actually in a convertible, uh, cutting across Florida from Tampa to uh, Orlando. To, uh, you know, a few of the guys recently got released. I think it's going to be there from the WWE. And, uh, you know, a few guys I haven't seen in a long time. And I think you might as well head over there. I just, uh, just had my first two matches in over 10 months out in California. Yeah. And, uh, definitely trying to get my feet back in the door. And, uh, see, it's not a bad time to go over to people over at TNA. And, uh, you know, get my name out there. Just let everybody know I'm taking books again. Uh, All right. Excellent. Uh, do me a favor, man. If you see Charlie Haas, tell him the guys from the interactive interview say hey. Interactive radio, huh? Did you guys get along with Charlie? Yeah, we just had him on last week, and he pretty much buried the WWE. <laughs> and yeah. it was a whole lot of fun, yeah. 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 All right. Yeah, I mean, I'll definitely say something to that, but, uh, you know, I'm definitely, uh, definitely look forward to seeing some old faces. I like that. I'm definitely trying to get uh, the name out there and get the word out that uh, I'm taking bumping. So uh, I got a new website on ChrisCanyon.net. Uh-huh. That's Canyon, one word, ChrisCanyon.net. Uh, there's contact information on there if anybody wants to uh, use me for any some shows or internet shows or, or want to book me on a show. So, uh, you know, I'm definitely looking for to take the bookings and uh, get my name back out there. Excellent. Well, back to your wrestling ability. Um, we always have discussions with people on the show about how important it is to sell. And we notice when you take bumps, um, it, it looks so sick, is it the way that you land on your neck, and it looks like you're, you know, compressing your spine. How are you able, how are you able to do that without actually suffering a severe injury? I, I guess I'm just real lucky in my flexibility. Uh, I don't know if it has, you know, I, I would imagine it has something to do with, you know, the fact that I'm somewhat tall, and I'm like, you know, six foot four. Um, 
I have control, very flexible in my upper back and my neck. Uh, and it saved me a few times. Uh, you know, a few bad bumps. Uh, he's not going to land it higher than I really wanted to. And, uh, you know, I, I do, do I, I've done a lot of stretches. And when I first started breaking in, I, I did a lot of work on my neck. Um, but, you know, I, I, I actually enjoy those bumps probably more than anything. I, I like belly to back bumps. And, and when I watched the whole tapes, you know, over the last month when I've been off and went back and watched the old matches I had with Benoit and when you give me that dragon, you know, full melt suplex. I mean, if you, you're not flexible, you can't take that move because you, you pretty much land on your head and if you're lucky, that's the top part of your neck. Mm. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's definitely, definitely as my career, but when I was first breaking in, a lot of veterans told me, uh, you'll always have a job to keep up and sell well. And, uh, you know, I've told that any, anybody that's uh, been coming up or any young guys that have been trying to break into the business, you know, if I can see their tape, you know, they bump and they sell. You know, I pretty much know. Keep up what you're doing. Mm. You know, if you make other people look good, people will always want to wrestle you. Mm. I actually uh, just uh, popped in a tape of uh, Great American Bash where you took in some sick uh, suplexes from uh, Perry Saturn. So, I mean, yeah, that, oh, Perry was fun to work, man. Perry has some great ideas, too. Um, you know, <laughs> you can be a little mean to some people at times, but uh, Perry, uh, Perry and me clicked pretty well together, man. We, you know, he was wide open. You know, I probably broke out more new moves in that one match against Perry than probably any other match in my career, and, uh, you know, Harry was fucking more, uh, sorry. That's all right. It's all right. We're taping it. It's cool. <laughs> Perry was willing and able to, uh, you know, make that match, uh, you know, something I was, you know, pretty proud of. Mm. Even now, you know, years and years later. So, yeah, mm. Perry was, Perry was fun guy to work with. Let me ask you this. In 1999, they did a, what I thought was going to be a hysterical gimmick with you being Raven's only friend, and of course it turns out that he's not, you know, poor, didn't have a poor childhood, he's rich and all this stuff. Why did they drop that so dead when it was getting over? You know, I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm, now that you mention it, I'm trying to think back of why they dropped it and how it got dropped, and I really, I remember filming the stuff. Right. You know, I remember that day that we went over to the, uh, man, you know, his mansion, and they hired, you know, his mom was there and stuff. Yeah. I don't even, I, to be honest, I don't even remember how that ended. It didn't end. It just kind of was, wasn't there on next week, and then I never mentioned it again. Yeah. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, that was, man, I, you know, maybe, I don't know if that's, maybe that's when Raven left. I, I, to be honest with you, I don't really remember how that ended. Mm. Uh, yeah, we asked him about it. We asked him about it, and he's like, they just didn't do anything with it. And he, he seemed annoyed, and he started to get annoyed because I think we remembered that, it. That was all Raven, man. I remember showing up at the taping, you know, at the, the mansion and at the mall. Mm hmm. And, uh, you know, we did the thing where we went shopping, too. And uh, the, the, the production girl that they had with us had no ideas at all. She didn't even know what we were filming. <laughs> and it was all on Raven to come. You know, I didn't, to be honest with you, I didn't know what we were doing either. And I was just told to show up there. Mm. And it was all up to Raven to come up with stuff. So, uh, you know, I think it was Raven's baby. It was Raven's little storyline. And, you know, a lot of times, and I, I think one of the problems in wrestling has been and will be for a while that it, it seems like, they bring in writers, they bring in comedy writers and television show writers. And, you know, just because somebody could write an episode of, of Friends, but if you watch the show, you can write an episode. You know all the characters. I mean, that's, that's easy. I mean, I could write an uh, episode of Friends or, or Seinfeld or The Simpsons because I know the characters. So right. It's to create characters, to create storylines. And, uh, you know, I think if you're going to use anyone, you should use the wrestlers. The, you know, these wrestlers are, you know, most of the guys, are, or a lot of the guys I've ver- worked with, incredibly creative. They know how to tie in a uh, comedy storyline with the wrestling and uh, if, you, if you have these Hollywood writers you're going to get one end of it you're just going to get either the comedy or the drama but you're not going to know how to tie that into the athleticism and the sport mm. and uh, you know that was you know I'm sure that would have gone well I'm sure that would have that would have been an angle of the storyline that paid off and had, it, had a you know beginning a middle and an end but they just never let us get past the beginning well I think you hit the nail on the head when you say that, you know, you can write an episode of Friends because you know the characters. It seems like a lot of the writers that come into wrestling don't know the characters, and who else would know the characters better than the people playing the characters themselves? Exactly. I mean, you know, it's, uh, you, you could start an episode of, you know, like I've been a side self friend my whole life. Uh, you know, if I start writing an episode, it, it, I mean, it, it's almost like a cliche, but you say it's going to write itself. It will, because, like, certain situations say, oh, you know, I know Kramer would have done this here. You know, I would, I know George would say this here. That, that's what they mean when, a, when something writes itself. Right. They, write it, I mean, they don't know our characters. They don't know wrestling. They don't know the history of the business. They don't know what other wrestlers have done in these same situations, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And I, I think, 
I mean, if I, if I had my own promotion, all I would be such, you know, wrestlers hand in storyline ideas, character ideas, and have one one or two wrestlers go through all the stuff, organize it, and that would be the show. You know, to bring in these people that don't know wrestling, don't like wrestling, don't have a history within wrestling, I, I just don't understand it. I, I think it's I, I think it's crazy. I think it's I think it's suicide. Well, you know, and as we mentioned before, we spoke with Charlie Haas, and that was one of his, like, uh, chief complaints, was that, you know, they have all these people in there writing for him, and, and he knows that they're not utilizing his talent the way it needs to be used. Um, everyone else that's working with him knows that, but yet no one's doing anything about it. You know, it goes back to when I got fired, when I got a call from Johnny Ace. Uh, my first question, of course, was why. And he told me, well, the writers just can't come up with anything for you. And I said, well, then maybe you should be firing them and not me. I'm doing my job. Not Bingo. I'm doing theirs. Yeah, you... Either that, either that was a lame excuse that he didn't want to give me the real re- reason, or they just avoided the main problem. You yeah. Know, but, you know, the writers can't come up with the boys. I mean, you know, the, the 13 or 12 previous years of my career before I got fired, it seemed like nobody really had a problem coming up with stuff on it, even on independence. Mm. Now, even this weekend... Uh, you know, uh, I worked a show in Chico, California, and this kid who runs the promotion, he's only 21 years old, and he knew how to use things. You know, <laughs> it worked perfectly. I mean, I, you know, it gets frustrating. It gets real frustrating at times. But, you know, the, the, like anybody else, the writers are going to have their favorite people, and, uh, you know, the, the guys they like are going to get pushed, and the, the guys that they don't like, they're going to not come up with stuff for. So, yeah. I'd like, probably say, hey, Charlie. Well, well, speaking about Hollywood and kind of production values and how things are written, you did a little work, obviously, on Ready to Rumble. What did you think about being out there in Hollywood and working on that film? It was a good opportunity. It was a good pitch. Uh, the timing wasn't the best. Uh, they had just put the tag belts on Nick and Age and Bigelow. Um, I remember actually going to, uh, to Eric's visual and telling him, I'd rather not go out and do that now because things go so well in my career. <laughs> he pretty much said I don't have a choice. <laughs> so, you know, no, no hard feel for Eric. Eric did so much for me. And, uh, you know, he saw a lot more in me than probably anybody else in the wrestling who made me catch the DDP. I mean, he's the one that he allowed me to hire 10 cruiserweights. Um, you know, it, I don't know if too many people know, but Eric had an interesting idea. He took uh, Peter Angle from uh, Tape by the Bell, the guy who created that, and a bunch of other Saturday afternoon type shows. And, uh, Eric had an interesting idea of a two-hour show on Saturdays, Saturday morning, to, you know, teenage type kids. But the first hour would be a Saved by the Bell type show with these young kids in, in high school getting into fights and arguing over girls and stuff. And then the second part of the show, second hour, would actually be those kids wrestling in their little local independent promotion. Uh, but it would be actual wrestling matches then. So Bishop came to me and said, here's $400,000 to go out and find 10 looking experienced cruise lights. And that's pretty much how I got in like Hurricane, uh, Shannon Moore, Jamie Noble, uh, uh, Joy Matthews, Christian York, Jimmy Yang, uh, actually off at AJ South, yes, he's from town. Um, but for, for Eric to give me power of spending $400,000 and trusting in me to, to produce, you know, let me do that. Let me to work on Ready to Rumble, but let me work on Jesse Ventura story. You know, he sent me out to do a music video for uh, Fifth Naked, and you know, he just let me do. Uh, he let me work on Arliss. I mean, he, he just gave me a lot more opportunities than anybody else ever has. And uh, you know, to, to send me out to work on Ready to Rumble was just such a great experience. You know, meeting David Arquette and working with him, and mm. it, it was just it was unbelievable. The, the, the stunt coordinator on that uh, is one of you know, he, he did the stunt coordinator who did Ready to Rumble also did Terminator Two and True Lies. Yeah. Joel, yeah, Joel Kramer. He's, you know, one of the biggest stunt coordinators in Hollywood history. Mm. You know, to be able to work hands, hand, yeah, I mean, pretty much every day with that guy. It was just, it's something I'll never forget. It, it, you know, helped form a friendship with Hurricane that to this day is very strong. So, mm. nothing but pretty much good memories about Ray Rumble. Yeah, you mentioned stunt work, and I can't go out, go throughout this entire interview without mentioning that sick bump you took off the Slambury Ray to Rumble cage. Uh, why do you think you don't get, and I don't know if this is going to be a stupid question, but why exactly don't you get, you know, any credit for taking that bump when it was pretty similar to the one that Foley took? Um, I'll, probably a couple of reasons. Number one, I was never pushed uh, or mocked as well as, as Mick was. Uh-huh. I never got the level of fame that Mick got. Um, mm-hmm. Mick went first 
Mick, Mick did his. Well, uh, to be honest with you, without, mm-hmm. without Mick doing his, I don't know if that's the idea of doing it would have popped into my head. Uh, that's, that's something I'll remember forever, Mick making that pop. Yeah. Mine was just 100% safer than Mick's. Yeah. You, know, all, you know, pretty much all of Mick's that he's done for cages, you know, off the top of the cage, in the, in the table. And uh, from what I remember, at least two that he did, uh, you know, in that same match, he took the choke slam and went through it, and then he also did a backdrop and a match later through it. Um, you know, those were, <laughs> those were really risky. Mine was relatively safe and planned out. You know, it still hurt. It, it didn't go exactly the way we had planned, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, the rampway is, is a lot bigger target than a small table or a lot softer target than the ring was. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I have no bitterness. I mean, I, I wish, and, and the company didn't follow up with it as much as WWE did. Now, right. WWE or WWF at the time, they showed it incessantly. And to this day, they'll show it every now and again. Right. Um, you know, the, the WCW, they, you know, a month later, Vince Russo had me beaming with Mike Awesome, the same guy who threw me off the cage. Yeah. That's, the to, that's the way to kill that angle. You know, in, that. My opinion, in my opinion, I should have never liked Mike Awesome after that. After that, after he tried to virtually kill me, I think the rest of my career I should have been in this club. You know, I, I remember Piper and Valentine back in 83. You know, they had that feud and it was a brutal feud and it ended with Stalkate 83. And, a, you know, a couple of years later, Valentine shows up on Piper's pit and they're still bitter. They still addressed it in a different promotion years later. Different promotion, exactly. Yeah, and they still addressed it. For me to want to team with the guy a month later, Mm. And that, that those are the type of booking ideas and writing ideas that I think make people make it hard for people to spend their disbelief. Uh, I agree with that. I mean, I remember I watched uh, Thunder in 1999, and Benoit took a dive off the top of the cage, and I thought to myself, "Wow, well, that's something they could put in a promo pack now." Never once was it showed again. You know, the funny thing about that is somebody called me the other day, and uh, you know, the WWE on live shows. They, uh, sometimes they, you know, like when they did that, uh, they did that Kid Rock song and they made a big video about it. Yeah. They, they used to show that before every live event, you know, at the TVs. Somebody called me the other day, they went to a live event and they said, uh, they have a new commercial at the show, uh, before the live events for, uh, WWE 24-7. Uh-huh. They said, my cage bump is actually on that. And I, uh, <laughs> my, the cage bump is actually on that. Oh. Like, the WWE promoting that bump more than the WCW ever did. <laughs> and in a time when you're not even working with the company. Yeah. I mean, it's, it just shows you that, you know, at times, WWE is just, you know, at times, it's a more superior product than WCW was. I mean, there, there were times, we, you know, we beat them 80-something weeks in a row, and we beat them, and at that time, WWE was struggling, and, and, and Eric had some great ideas, and even some of his not-so-great ideas somehow hit gold, and, you know, and we got real lucky, and, and Eric was motivated, and, yeah, we did some great stuff, but by and large, WWE is full of people who understand and love wrestling, and we had so many people on the production end in WCW that did not tell. I mean, one rat's ass about wrestling. I mean, at 5 o'clock, WCW headquarters empty. I, you know, my first week in WWE, we asked if we could get a tour, me and a few of the boys, I think Lance Dawn and Billy Kidman, a few other guys, we asked if we could get a tour of the building. While we're taking the tour, it's 9 o'clock at night, Vince McMahon was still in his office working, and he wasn't the only one in the building either. I mean, it was just, people there just take it more serious. And it's, I think Vince demands that you make rest of your life if you want to work for a company. That wasn't the case with WCW, and I, I think that's probably at least one of the factors why Vince put us out of business. Yeah. yeah. Well, why don't we talk about the positively Canadian gimmick? Um, I personally liked the gimmick, but it was sad that uh, the DDP match was not away until after uh, the whole thing had to hand out. Why did it take so long, and do you think it could have been better had that match happened around August or September? Oh, absolutely. The uh, funny thing is, I mean, I don't, I don't want people to, you know, get the wrong idea about Vince Russo. I, I talked to Mick Foley. When, when Vince Russo first came in, um, you know, there's a lot of hype, and I, I wondered how much he really had to do with the success of WWE, you know, at WWF at the time, before he came to WCW. And I actually asked Mick Foley what. And, you know, Nick Foley would have no reason to lie to me about something like that. And he claims that Vince Russo had a lot to do with, you know, WWE, WWF's success and, you know, their ability to overtake us once, once we had the lead. Mm-hmm. I don't want to take away anything Vince has done, Russo. Um, 
but I don't, you know, I also don't want people to get credit where it's not due. When I did the Possibly Canyon gimmick, which I did enjoy, and I thought it was tremendously well written, Vince was actually on sabbatical. Uh, they sent him home for a little bit, and it was actually Ed Ferrara and Disco Inferno writing that for me. Um, <laughs> so, if anyone's going to get the credit, it's going to be them. It was tremendously well written, I thought. Uh, we got it over within a month or so. We hit the you know, the Random Canyon kind of for responding. I viewed it with Booker T, you know, during that time. So it wasn't me just making fun of Paige and trying to go him. Yeah, she put me in with the top guy to feud with. Things are going real well, and then Vince Russo came back. As soon as he came back, I mean, he came back the night that the whole Hulk Hogan, Jeff Jarrett, Booker T title situation happened out of Florida. Uh huh. That was that was Vince's return. Yeah. And uh, you know, that night on that pay per view, very few people remember this. You beat Booker T, and Booker T yeah. goes on to be champion. Yeah. And literally a matter of hours later. Now, I'm not saying I was over enough time to, to have the next day pre match against Booker, and they were, they were already setting up for Booker towards Scott Steiner for the next pay per view. But I don't see, and, and Scott had heat with, you know, DDP at the time too. I don't see why I could have been Scott's little buddy that helped him harass Booker T. You know, it you know, let me be the one that got, you know, that, that, that would have been a good way for me, for Scott and Booker to continue that feud never have to wrestle each other until the pay-per-view by letting me do things. I mean, it's got team against Booker and somebody. You know, knocking away that one-on-one match. And I recommended it, but Vince Russo decided to put me in a field with Mark and include his mom and, and Mark Madden. And, you know, to go from beating Booker King the night he went to the world title to dealing with Mark Bagwell and his mom and having Mark Madden and, and me and Gino going involved in matches, I think it's just something that we built up very well and we worked very hard to build up. And it made it into a comedy spot. It made it into a joke. And uh, pretty much... And, and then, and then, you know, Paige got to the point, because of personal feelings, Vincent and DDP could not come to terms. Paige could not come back. You know, they would not work out a deal where they'd bring Paige back. There was a possibility that Paige would never come back. Hmm. When I looked at the truth, said, Vince, if, if Paige isn't going to come back, if you don't have an immediate plan to bring uh, DDP back, me doing the DDP gimmick is senseless. I mean, we're, we're teasing the fans. It's still later, you know, every time we hit his music, people went nuts. And they wanted to see him finally get their hands on him, get his hands on me. And, uh, you know, I said, if we're not going to do it, then that's, that's how you turn off fans. If, if you promise something and promise and never deliver, that's when fans stop watching. You know, and then we'll, then that's pretty much why this, the whole thing ended. Then when Paige finally did come back, you know, we're like, all right, let's build it back up. Vince's idea was, well, everyone expects you guys to do it, so let's team you. I'm like, there's a difference between expecting something and wanting it. They don't expect us to do it. They wanted us to do it. Yeah. You know? And it, it, those are the type of fucking ideas that I think if, I think if the boys had more say, things like that wouldn't have happened. I, th- I think that positive Italian thing would have taken off. And I think it would have been, at least got me to the, the spot where, you know, I should be U.S. heavyweight champ or on that level. I was top, you know, the boys like to use time like this, but you know, maybe top of the mid-card or bottom of the top. Yeah. Somewhere in that level. And, you know, I felt like I was on the verge of it, you know, beating Booker T the night he went to Ohio. Right. Well, and just to move from that to a few with Judy Bagwell is, to me, it would step down. Probably. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget thinking, what the hell are they doing when they had a Judy Bagwell on a forklift match? Yeah. You know, we did everything. You know, it's funny, you know, they, they throw these things at you and you try to argue. You know, it's, it's a fine line that some guys get away with arguing. Some guys get away with refusing to do things and some guys don't. Right. I was never the type that would, you know, I tried not to refuse too many things. I tried to refuse too many things, but, you know, sometimes it's just after. And, uh, you know, sometimes it didn't work and sometimes it did. And I tried as hard as I could with that one, but, you know, they just, I tried to make the best of what they gave me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, nothing against Buck. Tom was actually pretty over, and I think it was me and him, a serious type dude. I think it could have worked, mm. but once you throw in Judy Bagwell and and Mark Madden and and, and me and Gene and again nothing against those guys, but you put them in the ring and it, it kind of takes away the seriousness of what we were trying to accomplish. Yeah, but it had to be slightly fun to uh, diamond cut Judy Bagwell, right? Well, the worst part is we actually did it a couple of times and they refused to air it on TV. <laughs> really? Yeah, we did one in the back and they refused to air it. There was, you know, we had standards and practices in at that time, and you know. Uh, Buff actually told me. Buff actually told me he had a... Sorry, to get you off. Buff, Buff Bagwell actually told me that his mother was black and blue all over her legs from him. Yeah, yeah, she was black and black and legs pretty good. But it was, I like Judy. She's actually a great person. And, you know, Buff was, 
you know, he was pretty relatively easy to work to, you know, relatively easy to work with. Um, you know, my, my forte is, you know, I like the bigger moves and I like the high spots. And, you know, Paul did have the neck injury, and that was the only thing that, you know, in my opinion, prevented us from having better matches. Um, but other than that, man, we got a long race. We, you know, it's still fun to call matches with him and, and figure out what we're going to do out there. And, you know, we both, I, I think, you know, Buck had been, a, you know, a major star up to that point. He knew, you know, he was in the NWO and he's had some great runs and he's been well over. I think he also, I, I think some extent he might have seen it step down to have to work with me and then to go to comedy and made it even worse. I don't know how much his home was into that view. Um, I think we were both. You know, they were talking about going two or three pay per views. I think we were both relatively happy when they made it just one. We, I think we were both afraid when, when they were going to go next with it, you know? Yeah. So, it was a good time. But, you know, the one thing I, I, I hate these people who sit there and write books about, you know, the fall of WCW and how it happened and why it happened when, man, if you weren't there, if you weren't experiencing it, I just don't know if you have the insight to write a book like that. You know, standards and practices, in my opinion, was a major factor. You know, they just they would limit so much what we could and couldn't do on TV. Mm. You know, when, when once they were allowed in, man, and if there was a fans of this guy at every show watching everything we did, who had no care about wrestling, didn't know it, didn't like it, and any time he could say you can't do that, he would do it. And that really limited what we can do, and that's when Vince was pushing the envelope with DX, and, you yeah. know, it's just hard to compete. You know, you know to me, with fans and practices hurt us, uh, you know, just the executives that... that Turner, uh, you know, there's a warrior they had in charge, and then Siegel, and there was just so many people working against us from within the company. I think our own travel department was sabotaging our company. They, they were, they would change my ticket. And it was, they, people say, why, why? Our travel department was a separate entity within Time Warner than WCW. So if they would charge WCW extra money to, you know, for flights, their profit margin would go up and ours would go down. So they, every time they changed one of my tickets, if I had an e-ticket, they wouldn't change it. They would just buy a brand new one, and that e-ticket would sit in the system. And then after two years, it would expire. So they'd buy me two or three tickets per travel. And, then, you know, things like that, I'm sure. Our, our books are horrible because other parts of Time Warner were, you know, doing shady stuff like that. And it was just, you know, people that write books and they don't have stuff like that. If they weren't there, it's, it's frustrating to read these things. Wow. Well, let me ask you this question then. There was talk on the internet at the time that you were going to be part of the radicals that went and left at WCW in late 1999. Is there any truth to this? The only reason I did not leave when the radicals left was I wasn't at that pay-per-view. If I was, I was home. If I was at that pay-per-view, I would have walked out with them. Um, there was, you know, I had my own feelings up in WWE and what, what the radicals did leave. You know, I had feelings up there and... You know, WWE definitely wanted me. They made me, you know, couldn't make me a fiscal offer because, you know, I was contract tampering and stuff. But I was 99.9% .9 sure that not only did I have a contract waiting for me, that uh, it was going to be a significant increase in pay from what I was making in WCW. And I was making pretty good money. Um, I pretty much let it be known that, you know, we, we had a, a Nitro in the SL Coliseum that Monday. Uh -huh. um, and I, I told... Uh, you know, I, I, I let it be known that I'd pretty much get my release that Monday, and I'd be in Titan Towers that Tuesday, and I'd sign the deal if there was one waiting for me. And the only thing I stopped it was they wouldn't give me my release. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it would have been about a month after the radical got there. For example, I was on the pay-per-view where, where Chris won the title from Sid. I probably would have jumped with them and probably, you know, hopefully would have been part of that group. His infinite wisdom wouldn't let me go. You know, the funny thing is when I asked them, you know, when I told them, Bill, uh, you know, I want my release. He, you know, I can't confirm his consent, but he walked away from me. He said, oh, I'll get right back. He walked over to someone, and I'm 95% sure he asked the person that he was told him who I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so finally, you know, finally, he came back to me, and, you know, we went to an office. He asked me why, and I said, sick and ship. I don't want to be on it. But he got, you know, that's, that's good. The same weekend that Hulk Hogan, you know, went online and said, Billy Kidney couldn't draw a, in a flea market. Uh, you know, you got one of our top guys like that talking about Billy Kidman, you know, that's not the that's not way a team should be working. You know, we're, we're sabotaging each other. And I told Bill Bush, and I, I was mad at that point. Once he said no, I was pretty mad. So uh, I, I have Billy. to imagine you would be. Uh, so I was calling Billy. So I was saying, Billy, let me tell you something, pal. I'm like, WWE's preempted tonight to the uh, dog show. I said, I guarantee you, off my word, the dog's going to beat us. And sure enough, the dog's uh, do a better race.
journey that night. But it was it was a sinking ship, and it was everybody was trying to get off. And and, and that show absolutely was dreadful. That it was a Valentine's Day show, as a matter of fact. Yep. And that show just sucked. I mean, it, they had such a great opportunity there, and they just let it pass them by. I mean, a great market. I think they had me work. I believe Dustin Rhodes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was already. So I was just wanted out. So I just pulled up, just beat the crap out of me, didn't tell them over. I don't really care. You know, it was. It was. Uh, it's real fun. To have somebody like Bill Bush, and you know, I don't know the guy perfectly, but he just did things like, like you rode in coach with us, which some would say, yeah, he's showing any team player. I just saw him as a, as a mark, as a moron. <laughs> uh, I think somebody. I, I think you need to be somewhat intimidated and afraid of your boss. Uh, I'm not going to go to Mr. Man and scream at him. You know, he's an intimidating guy. He's the boss. He's the man. Eric Bischoff did not try to make friends in that company. You know, Eric Bischoff, you know, when he said something, you believed it. Because he was Eric Bischoff, and people were afraid of him. You know, Bill Bush, nobody, you know, I would never call, you know, Eric by his first name or, or Vince by his first name in a situation like that. And I wouldn't call him Vinny or, you know, Little Eric or whatever. You know, but Billy had, he had no power. It showed. I mean, it, it, when, when you're on a sinking ship, you need a captain that's strong and firm, and that's the last thing we had. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the last gimmicks you had in WCW was a creepy gimmick, and you were coming up from the bottom of the stage and everything. Was that going to continue had Bischoff actually purchased the company? I mean, would we have seen in that advance? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, like I said, Eric doesn't have that many friends in the business. Eric's uh. not once tried to make friends in the business. Eric's a businessman, and, and uh, you know, he... I'd say we got along well. I don't know if I'd go as far as say we were friends, but I felt real confident with him back in power that, you know, I'd be taken care of and I was comfortable to stay there. Uh, the only reason I even wanted to get out of there was I, I could tell they were no longer behind Eric 100%. And I just felt his job was uncertain. Her job was uncertain. So was mine. And, you know, I was like, at that point, you know, I felt like I had a better place for New York. And, you know, Bill Bush, you know, I wasn't there for a lot of that, but you know, I heard stories that in meetings you say, if anybody wants their release, just come and ask for it, I'll give it to you. You know, and then I go and ask for it and I don't get it. It was you know, and I understand why. I didn't want I think once the radicals left, if, if they had two more guys leave, I think that and, and, and they would have done something good with me and whoever else still I think the point gates would have opened. I think everybody would have been asking for their release and then it would have been hard for Bill Bush to say no. You know, and he say, Well you let the radicals go, you let Hang go, you let Kiffin or Colin have go. You know, why wouldn't you let me go? You know, and then it might have been lawsuits and stuff like that. So, I understand why he said no, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to be mad at it, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, regardless if WCW was the greatest place in the world to work or the worst place in the world to work, you got to admit, though, that having some place else to work was definitely a better thing, time for the business. It just seems like no matter what the boys are doing or where they're at in their career, they always think the grass is greener on the other side. I mean, we're all... You know, a lot of WWE guys back then were miserable. I'm sure a lot of WWE guys back then were miserable. Um, you know, but, it, you know, I hear the all up in New York being great right now. And, you know, I heard the TNA guys complain. And, you know, it's like, it, it seems like the guys have always been happy. You know, it's funny, right before I got fired, a lot of us sitting around saying, remember the good old days in WCW? And I said, wait a second, we're all miserable. We were all trying to jump up and you know, I'm like, maybe now we look back and realize that it was a lot better back then, but... You know, that's, you know, so we greener on the other side. Like, the reality situation, like, the guys like to bitch and moan, the guys like to complain, and, uh, you know, I think no matter how good it gets, they're always going to have to find something to uh, bitch and moan about. And I, I think that's, with me coming back now, I, I think with that realization, and, you know, I think the last year, last two years, last three years, I've been doing a lot, and understand the business a little bit more, and understand what I want out of the business, and where my role is, and, I'm looking forward to getting back there and uh, trying to have some more fun with it this time. Mm. Well, uh, let me ask you this question. Um, when you were actually released from the WWE, do you feel that the injury that you obtained slightly beforehand was really uh, one of the deciding factors? Um, because it seems like when you're ready to come back and, you, and you'd come back for a few times and then it was over, do you think that that kind of well, was a major deal? And how severe was that injury really? Because we obviously heard reports, um, I mean, that it was extremely serious. But, uh, you know, I'd like to hear from your perspective as to how serious it really was, obviously, being the person it was happening to. Um, well, if you really look back, at, we obviously, the, 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 
I had a great run when I first got to WWE, and uh, you know, I was having the time of my life. I mean, you know, I love doing positive with the uh, Canyon, uh, but the, the company was still somewhat in shambles at that time. I like working a lot with Ed Ferrara and, and, and Disco, and you know, but just the uncertainty. You know, when Russo came back, things changed. When Russo was dead, things changed. When Eric got control, things changed. And you didn't have that. You didn't have that stern force of this man overseeing everything, and no, things wouldn't drastically change overnight. WCW, literally, I mean, obviously, on my, on my way to the airport to go to Panama City, I still didn't know that the company was going out of business. You know, mm-hmm. and at that point, I still believed that there was a confusion, the media was going to get control of the company. And by the time I went to Panama City, I knew that this was an important company. So things were changing a lot in WCW. WWE, you always have this, and you kind of know where you stand. Um, it was... It wasn't so much interest, I don't think. If you really go back and tape and figure out, you know, when I started winning and when I was losing, the first few months were great. They put, they put the U.S. belt on me. They put the WWE tag belt on me. Uh, I was on almost every show, wrestling on almost every show. Uh, I mean, they were utilizing me great, and I was happy. Um, I dropped the strap to Jerry, the U.S. belt. Mm-hmm. I, I lost tag belts in August at SummerSlam to Kane and uh, Undertaker. And then on uh, September 10th, actually the day before 9-11, I lost the U.S. belt to Jerry. And pretty much that was the beginning of the end. Uh, you know, once I didn't have that belt, I was pretty much relegated to, you know, to low positions on the card, and then totally wasn't even on Raw or SmackDown. And then before you knew it, I was doing dog matches. And it was actually dog matches against Randy Orton where it was me. So I don't think the injury, I think, I think the handwriting was already on the wall when the injury happened. And I think the injury just, you know, maybe made them say, you know what, we already didn't really plan on doing much with him. Mm. And now that he's, you know, quote unquote injury prone, you know, I think I think that probably had a lot more to do with, uh, and I, I think it just sped up, or if it anything, it might have actually prolonged my career there, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, they might have been on their way of facing me out anyway. You know, maybe they just kept me around for their But, uh, you know, from that point on, it's, they just never had really much they wanted to do with me, I don't think. Hey, you know? And the injury itself, as I said, how severe was that really going through it? The, the knee injury obviously was serious. The, uh, you know, it was an ACL tear, complete tear. Uh, Dr. Andrews has always done a phenomenal job putting back Kelly to barely even see the scar. Uh, you know, it took me a little longer to get to, to recover from that. Um, you know, but I was ready in about five months, five and a half, six months. Uh, went to OVW and then the shoulder injury happened. And the shoulder injury is very, very serious. Uh, the infection got into the shoulder. Um, I was unconscious for two days. My friends rushed me to the hospital. I uh, woke up a day later from that. They rushed me in on a Sunday night, actually, right after a uh, WWE pay Um I woke up Monday night. The doctor told me, you know, we need to operate on you. I didn't even know where I was. Um, I told him I wanted a second opinion. He told me I didn't have time. I'd lose the arm if they didn't do it. Uh, so I told him to go ahead and do it. And uh, you know, I woke up like two days later from surgery. And uh, I had to be keeping wounds on the arm. And, and my lungs started filling up with fluid. I couldn't breathe. They had to rush me to the ICU. Uh, my blood oxygen level dropped to 40 percent. They thought at that point, I mean, the doctor told me there was a chance I was going to die. Uh, they weren't sure why the lungs filled up with fluid. Um, but any time the blood oxygen level drops beyond below 90, they get nervous. I was all the way down to 46. I was passing out from lack of oxygen. It was, it was stressful and scary. Uh, but they just gave me uh, some Lasix to pretty much drain all the uh, fluid out of my body and uh, recovered. I was in the hospital six days. I went in at 240 pounds. I came out at 208. I lost 32 pounds in six days. And it was tough. I tried to come back from that. The knee injury and then the shoulder injury. Now I'm down, you know, I'm down to 208 pounds. I don't like the way I'm looking. I don't feel good. I have to chill. To, to, to really work hard to come back, it was hard to get motivated to do it. And once I decided, you know, I'm going to do it, I really set my mind because I worked as hard as I've ever done in my career to, to get physically back in shape and mentally ready to, you know, be on the road and get back and for them to do nothing with me. That's <laughs> frustrating. And, you know, it, it made me, when it was the opportunity, when, when they fired me, it felt more hold off my shoulders than maybe an upset. You know, I was, I was on the verge of quitting anyway. I'd actually told Kidman a couple of weeks earlier that I, I wanted to quit. But then I saw a second guess myself. You know, it was hard to give up the money. It's hard to give up a career that you love. But mentally, I just wasn't, I, I wasn't in the game anymore. I just, I just was mentally done. Mm. And uh, I knew I needed time off. 
uh, you know, we left on good terms. They told me, uh, you know, go off and do what you want to do, find things inside of outside of wrestling if you want. But they told me, you know, it, it had to come a time and I really want to come back, keep them call, and they would work things out. So, mm. you know, you can never say never. You know, I, I think we left on relatively good terms. I had a great, you know, great time up there. The first few months especially. Um, I took, they took care of me when I did you. They, they didn't fire me when I did you. Um, you know, it's just business, and, you know, we didn't hang out on a personal level, but, you know, I, of course, have a lot of respect for what he does. I, I still enjoy the product a lot. I still watch it every week, and, uh, you know, it's, it's the right thing to in place. I'd love to be back in WWE someday. If not, you know, I'm enjoying the time on the independence. You know, I'm on my way to TNA right now, so you can never rule that out. Uh, I, I uh, maintain a real strong friendship with Snaggy, you know, we do it in Japan. Uh, you know, now the kid is always, I know Kidman, you know, probably has ideas of maybe on Japan. So, you know, I, I still see my future in the business pretty bright. Um, I've been doing it 13 years. I was in those 13 years, I've had a lot of TV exposure, but I don't, I don't think I've been played out. I, I don't think I've been overused for the whole of my time off. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think there's still things I can do to, you know, I can be a fresh character. And, uh, you know, with uh, 13 years of experience, but I'm still relatively young and only 35 years old, so mm. I'm pretty optimistic about my future. Mm. We actually called you about a month before you got your WWE release, and I think your exact quote to us was, you can't do anything because you're, quote, a slave to the office. <laughs> I don't remember saying that, but I wasn't exactly in the right frame of mind back then. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's funny. You, you have these dreams and ideas, and, and mine goes back to the age of 14 of, this is what you want to do. And, you know, it's just a, man, it's an obscure artist. It's Joshua Cadison, and he has a line in one of his songs, Some Dreams Are Better From Afar, that's just the way things are. And, you know, the, so the, the dream of being a wrestler is a great dream, and, you know, I have no regrets about doing it, and I still want to do it, and I still love doing it. Mm. But a lot of times the dreams and the reality is, you know, and you think everything's going to be great, and you're going to be a superstar, and you're not going to have personal problems anymore, you're not going to have family problems, you're not going to have financial trouble, you're not going to... You know, you're not going to worry about your goals anymore, but, you know, even though you, you make it to what you, you set your goals and you reach them and you, you get there and, you know, you're, you're happy doing what you're doing, life goes on and there's still problems you got to deal with. And mm -hmm. within that dream, within that career, there's, there's problems and, and, you know, mm -hmm. challenges. You know, I talked to Mikey Bass, uh, Billy Kidman's son at the PNA. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I tell him how, how at times, how miserable we would get, you know, how, how much you bitch him on, or how much you complain. So I just don't understand that. You know, if I was being, you know, instead of being, you know, if I was, if I was on the TNA, I just can't understand how you guys be miserable when you're making that kind of money after big shows. I'm like, dude, it's just, this business has a way of dating you after a while. You know, my first few years when I wasn't making a dime, I definitely, you know, I was working, I'd work shows for the fabulous for a while. Mm -hmm. Put over her top baby face. Not only not get paid, she would then charge me ten dollars to buy the tape of the show so I could watch how I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you know, and I was happy then. You know, I would do it gladly. We go from past making, you know, six figures and, and pitching a hole in it every week. It, 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 it makes you start to wonder how that could happen. And, you know, with that realization now and, and you know, with the experience I've had, I, I'm funny. I'm looking forward to my. It almost feels like I'm getting a second career. I, uh, you know, getting myself back in shape and deciding I want to do this again. I think I'm going to enjoy it more this time. I think, I, I think it's going to just be a lot more fun this time. Yeah. Uh, as to probably as much as I did when I was 18, I think. Well, excellent, dude. We can't appreciate your time any more than we do. We just have a couple more questions for you before we let you off this phone. And this is kind of a weird question, but what did you do in the meantime, since you got your WWE release, to now? I was a little crazy here, yeah, man. I, 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 like I I've mentioned a few times, I wasn't exactly in the best state of mind that last year, especially after I came back from injury and I wasn't getting used well. And I, 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 you know, I did, I did something that's very typical of someone that's not in a, a very strong mental state. I went up and, and bought a house down in Florida, even though, you know, my job wasn't exactly secure. And I didn't even put my house in Atlanta on the market. So, uh, you know, once I got fired, now I had two mortgages to pay and no income. Uh, you know, I had to, I stressed a lot about that. I ended up having to go up to Atlanta and, you know, do some work on the house and try to sell that. Uh, took care of some personal and family uh, problems up in New York, spent some time up there with my family. And, you know, just trying to get my head back on straight and trying to get uh, my life back in order. And, uh, you know, once I, and I, and I 
kind of tried to decide what I want to do. I mean, I, a lot of ideas popped in my head. I had an opportunity to open a homeless shelter up in New York. And I looked into that. And, you know, it was something I was interested in doing and, and working with, uh, you know, with a family member on my uh, uh, sister-in-law's side. And we were going to work together on it. And uh, it just kind of fell through. And then I said, well, that wasn't meant to be. What's next? And, you know, I just thought about a bunch of different things and uh, kind of what I want to do for a living. And the longer, you know, it's funny, the longer you're away from wrestling, the more you want it. Mm. Further and further I got from that date I got fired, I uh I, I itched, I hungry to come back and you know, now now that I think I got my head back on straight exactly the way I want it and got my life pretty much in the order I want it, you know, I, I definitely know for a fact that rest is my future. And uh, I, I just can't wait to see what happens over the next you know, three, four months to a year. I, I think it's gonna be exciting. I think I think a lot of people will be surprised. I think uh I'm real excited. I, I think, you know, me and you talk six months from now, mm-hmm. you'll we'll be able to look back at today and say, wow, it's been a lot of time in the last six months. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a fun ride. Excellent, excellent. We sat down with... do a quick few word associations, if you don't mind, before we let you off the phone. We're just going to give you a name. If you have a story to share, that'd be excellent. Okay. First name that we're going to have on the list is uh, Diamond Dallas Page. Wow. You know, a lot of people say I'm a, a page dude, I'm a page kiss ass. Page took a liking in me when I was in the power plant before I even got on TV. Uh, I don't know what he saw me in, saw in me, or, or why he liked me, or or why he thought I had potential or a future. But Page, when I was later, you know, talked to this show for me, gave me my first contract. Uh, you know, Page did more for me than I ever have or ever could do for him. You know, so that makes me a page stooge or a page, you know, ask this for guys, that's what I am. But, you know, I'm the type of person, someone helps me, I'll always, you know, do whatever I can for them. And page done, with the exception of maybe Eric Fisher, probably more for me than anyone in my entire career. I will say this, uh, we had Diamond Dallas Page on the show in December, and we actually threw your name in as one of the word associations, and his answer to that was, he should have made it. That's all he said. Ah, very interesting. Hmm. I, I'm glad he didn't say the absolute worst person at returning phone calls. That's me as well. <laughs> well he, he's, got, he's, he's, literally, he's literally written me off at times. He literally said he will no longer be my friend because I refuse to return phone calls. Well, I think he, he, you should have made it to the upper echelon. It's an a know, know, heavyweight um, champion. Which uh, coming I from appreciate that. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I should have. I don't think I, at the time, I don't think I ever believed I could be there. And if you don't believe in yourself to be there, you shouldn't be there. Um, I'm not saying that's the case now. But I'm saying, you know, in the first 13 years of my career, I just, I, I, I think I always saw myself as maybe a top of the middle guy. And that's as high as I got. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time to create your own reality in this business, maybe even in life. And, you know, I created a lot of my own reality there. You know, I, I pull it on myself. And, you know, once you, once you create a limitation, you got to live with it. That's, that's what I did. But uh, hopefully I'll pass that now. Next thing we have on the list for you is uh, the Hurricane Shane Helms. Uh... I should have made it. <laughs> um, I, I think Hunter kids are unbelievably incredible talent. One of the best minds in the business, too. I mean, he's unbelievably creative. Uh, just great ideas to everybody. I mean, he had, when we were in WCW, and he, he knew I had a little bit more show there than, you know, a lot of guys. And he just came up with so many brilliant ideas for ring introductions. And, and not just for him. I mean, he's a generous guy when it comes to that. He, he had great ideas for Scott Steiner and, and uh, you know, music for guys. Pretty much every level of the business, he has ideas. He's a real smart kid. Um, you know, he, he's, you know, some people say anybody could get over with that gimmick. I don't think anyone could. Uh, you know, I don't think anyone would get over with the Goldberg push. You know, Goldberg had a certain intensity that, you know, without that intensity, I don't think a Goldberg push would work. Uh, right. So I don't think anybody would dive into the character of the Hurricane as much as, you know, Shane Helms has. And, you know, I, I think he shows an incredible talent. And, uh, you know, I, I think his best days are ahead of him. I think people get very arrogant when they say that somebody would get over, no matter what they did, with a certain character. Like, everybody always says that about Hogan. Anybody could have made it if they had Hogan's push. Well, no, you had to make the best of your push. Yeah, not everyone's going to get a Hogan push. Hogan's got a Hogan push because Hogan knew he deserved that push. Yeah. Now, Hogan believed in himself before he believed in wrestling or anything else, and that's why he's at where he's at. Hmm. Got, uh, how about we got four names left for you, and then we'll let you go. Uh, how about Jeremy Borash? Uh, but, you know, Borash has always been a good friend of mine. We've had some fun together. We went to Germany together. 
do some ridiculous game show. Um, I'll tell you what about Jeremy Boris, man. When, when WCW went out of business, Jeremy was scared. Uh, all of a sudden, he didn't have a job. He didn't know what to do. He wasn't certain that WWE would be interested in, you know, what to bring to the table. Um, he didn't know what to do. Uh, you know, I actually opened up my house to him when I moved in. And uh, I watched him just create opportunity for himself. He put together that, that uh, Australia tour with the Manus. Yeah, WWE. He placed the American liaison on him. And he was on that phone from like 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. every day, talking to the boys, negotiating contracts. And he created himself a great career. You know, and he's one of the hardest working guys in the business that I've been around. Mm. Uh, Father James Mitchell. <laughs> Oh, boy, that is one strange character. Oh, yes, he is. <laughs> There's a lot, you know, I, I always feel in wrestling that you'll get over the most when you're most like your real self. And if you've ever seen Stone Cold, he must get punked on uh, MTV in that punk show. And Steve Austin is Steve Austin. He is a, he's a tough redneck who'll tell you like it is right in your face. <laughs> and when, when they let him be that character, that's when he got over. Mm. I think I think I think if you let if you let Jim Mitchell be Jim Mitchell, I think people would be making movies about him. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. That guy is he is just an interesting character from start to finish. And uh, in my opinion, I mean, uh, if, if he was around 20 years ago, everybody would know his name because you know when when in the year in, in an era when managers were heavily utilized utilized right, he would have been a top guy. No, oh, the uh, guy is there's second to none in terms of talking. He's, in my opinion, if at times best talker in the business, if he was given the right material in the right situation, I think he would be known by many, not just a friend, you know, the giant. I think most people would always listen as one of the top talkers in the business if he was ever used to his full potential in the right situation. Hmm. And I guess there's only one name left on the list, and I know that what people are going to say, so go ahead and say genius. How about Vince McMahon? <laughs> well, I am trying to get work back up there. Uh, <laughs> Good point. I, I, yeah, but I think, I think the genius of Vince McMahon is different than probably most people would see it. I think Vince, obviously a very smart guy, but more than his genius. I mean, I think he's probably pushing guys he shouldn't push. I think he's definitely let go of people he shouldn't let go of. I don't know how much... You know, to be honest, I don't know how, how much he has say over that. You know, I don't know if he just, you know, I, I'm someone on my level, I, I don't know if they can release me without him saying okay or, or no. You know, I mean, there is a line there. I mean, they don't bother him with any firing and firing. Um, mm. But one thing I'll say about this man, he has balls. Uh, try the XFL, try WBS. Um, to turn, you know, I think it's close to my friend today, to turn Sergeant Florida into a, a, a Iraqi sympathizer right during the Gulf War and then put the trap on him to try to build for Romania as heaven. And maybe it wasn't a great idea, but it was a ballsy idea. Uh, Vince has balls, and, 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 you know, again, he's dedicated and loves his business. Um, you know, like I said, I get a tour of the Titans out at 9 o'clock at night and him still be there working his ass off. You know, Vince McMahon, you know, if anything else, he's got balls, he loves the business. The only thing I would question is, I mean, I know I love this business. I know the people, you know, like the little kid man, Hurricane, are from Pat Hardy, especially as who love it. That's why we're in it. I don't know why someone who loves it as much as Vince, I believe, loves it, why he would push like a Nathan Jones, who doesn't give one last ass about this business. But there's so many guys out there that love this business. I, I think if you have total control, you should only be pushing people who love it. Well, there's certain yeah, I, things he's done, too. I mean, look at what he did with the Ultimate Warrior. He gave him endless opportunities when he proved oh, time and time again he didn't like it. He didn't want to be in the business. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, you know, about the Warrior, that's how the guy got over. I mean, Vince, Vince, like anybody else, he's human. He has a like, and he has a dislike. And it's impossible when you run a company to not let that affect your decision-making. Um, you know, obviously, there are times when Vince is, you know, loves big muscle guys, you know. You know, I think that's why Hulk probably got his original push, and you know, Warrior got his. You know, but then Vince also, I, I think, also recognizes how believable talent and smaller guys like Shawn Michaels and, you know, Bret Hart. You know, he's definitely an interesting guy, and it, I'll tell you, I've never been more intimidated by a human being in my life than Vince McMahon. Hmm. He is a tough guy to sit down and talk to. <laughs> I would imagine so. Thank All you. right. Thanks, bro. We really can't thank you enough for your time, brother. Uh, I apologize. I have one other word association. This will be the last one. It's kind of a goofy one. How about Club Canyon? Oh, 
Wow, how do you guys know about Club Canada? Uh, I used to listen to WCW Live, actually. <laughs> I've actually quit drinking uh, July 4th of last year. I'm a year sober. Not that I didn't have a major problem with it, but I've been drinking for five started when I was like 13, so I think 21 years is plenty. So I decided to quit drinking, but the only beer I've had in the past year was the last night at Club Canyon when I actually finally did sell the Atlanta house. You know, it was, it was a sad time. I had some great parties there. And we put up a Canyon Tron once that was 20 foot by 40 foot and showed a pay per view on it. Had a lot of people in and out of that house. Eric Bishop was in there and, and Bill Barron's and uh, you name Matt Hardy was there. And a lot of people came to Club Canyon Party. <laughs> Definitely miss Club Canyon. Excellent, brother. Well, we appreciate your time once again to all our fans listening. Please check out Chris Candy at that. And that's. And anyone interested in Booking Canyon can also find out booking contact information through chriscandy.net. Chris, it's an excellent pleasure to have you on the show, man. We wish you nothing but the best. Thank you, guys. All right, have a good one, buddy. This is Interactive Wrestling Radio. 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 Oh, what a rush. Featuring the interactive interview. 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 Oh, yeah. Formerly the Blaze. 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 The Blaze Rock. You know, maniacs, so what you gonna do when a Blaze of Maniacs runs wild on you? On WrestlingEpicenter.com. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. The Wrestling Epicenter. Don't get off. And now we shamelessly name drop from our history. The Wrestling Epicenter would like to apologize for the following. All right, everybody. Viva la raza. Viva la raza. Hey, y'all. Hello, ladies. Hey guys, we had a lovely conversation. First lady, absolutely. Oh, look at me. She's so kooky. <laughs> Hi. Be there. World. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Wrestling. Episode. Oh my god, you win! Wow. Interactive. Whoa! Let's go. I was gonna shoot him. Yeah. Yeah. I almost pissed my pants. <laughs> Breaking neck. I got two words for you. Yeah. Yeah. I heard a lot about you guys. Yeah. Right here. Well, let's go. I see my language. Get over the shot. Hey. Thank you, no. Know. We're into the many. No, no. That was great. It's gonna be cool. Woo! What it's all about. The purest point of view. The living life. Champion. Arrogant. Instead of statement, I'm talking to you. Rizma. In the land of extreme. Testify. Nevermore. Interactive. Interview. I'm not just the best. Oh. Interactive. Interview with a plastic board. You earn the right. Nobody. All right. You better keep listening. Thank you very much. Controversy creates cash. Professional wrestling. In the USA, baby. Memphis wrestling. I'm down. <laughs> The guy on fire. I'm not going to talk to you, dummies. We were sexy. What a show. The one and only. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Wrestling Epicenter. Interactive Interview. We took care of the business. This isn't ballet. We are huge. It is all over. You're where it's at. You better recognize who's the best. Make sure you tune in each and every week. Well, I'll come out of your computer. Knock down your door and turn it on for you. Well, I'm going to kick your stinker teeth in. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Tick tock. Tick Have a nice day. It's showtime. Don't forget to like and subscribe.